In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. For more than 20 years, God has used Bill and Annabelle Gillum to help people understand and appropriate the truths of Galatians 2.20. Through their tapes, books, seminars, and nationwide radio program, thousands of people have found freedom and fulfillment as they have learned how to let Christ live in and through them. Now just imagine allowing God himself to express his life through you in your family, your work, and everywhere you go. Join Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum and discover why Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Hi, gang. You know, the New Testament says over 160 times that we Christians are in Christ, in him, in whom, and so forth. Now, Annabelle is going to show us how appropriating this truth will really give us peace in the storms of life. Let's watch. We use our imagination constantly in our lives. We may not think we do. But gals, when we go shopping, we see a dress and we imagine how we would look in it. You know, kind of like a Elizabeth Taylor maybe or something like that. Uh, we read a mystery story and we read until uh, one o'clock and we turn the lights off and then we lie in bed and we can't close our eyes and we just imagine we hear things all the time. So we use our imagination a lot. Webster says that imagination is the act or power of forming mental images of what is not present. I've come under some criticism for this, but I believe that we need to use our imagination with the Bible. Mm. Um, you know, you can read the scripture that says Mary was at the foot of the cross, and it doesn't mean a great deal to you. And then uh, one time I saw uh, a television program and this man, in his imagination, had drawn up a picture of what that was. And all at once, that scripture meant something to me. And I was there with Mary, and she was holding the lifeless body of her beloved son. And it was rainy, and it was dreary, and it was stormy. And tears were streaming down her face, and she was wailing. And all at once, I knew what it meant. Mary was at the foot of the cross. Bill says it uh, in his inimitable way that we need to put flesh and blood with the rose of black print on white paper in our Bible. You know, theology by itself can be very cold and dead. Yeah. And uh, you can have a lot of underlinings and highlights in your Bible, but unless you know what it's talking about. So, let's use our imagination. Let's say that you're married you're very happily married, and some of you will have to imagine real hard on that. <laughs> and uh, our country is thrown into a war. So you and your husband talk about it and decide, yes, he needs to enlist. And so he does. And uh, he goes off to boot camp or training camp, whatever you call it. He comes home for four or five days after that, and they're wonderful days. Uh, together and uh, you're real careful not to let your flesh control you here because you know you're not going to see him for a while so it's just perfect time those four or five days and then he's gone and uh, he's very good about writing he writes to you regularly and you hear from him and then all at once the letters stop coming uh, you have no idea where he is you just know that he's in combat somewhere and the letters stop coming. And of course, you're, you're worried, you're concerned. And then one day, there's a knock at your front door. And you go to the door, and there's a gentleman there who gives you a notice from the government and says, we're sorry to inform you that your husband has been taken as a prisoner of war. Well, now then, your husband's captors are lenient in one respect. 
they are going to allow him to communicate with you. One time, just one time. And they tell him, uh, we're going to let you write to your wife or your family. You let us know when you're ready. Well, do you think he'll say, I want to write this afternoon? I don't. I think that, that he will keep notes about the things that he wants to share with you, remembering how you depend on his advice, remembering the, the situations that you're going to face. He wants to be sure that he tells you everything that uh, he wants to, so he keeps notes. And then one day he says, I'm ready to write my letters. So they bring him some paper and a pencil, and he writes to you. And uh, lo and behold, you get a letter. It's his handwriting. It's from him. And he tells you uh, that uh, he's a prisoner and this and that and the other. But he says, uh, I just had this opportunity one time to write to you. And so he said, I wanted to share these things with you. And so he begins talking to you. And he says, um, now about finances, uh, this is what I would advise you to do uh, in disciplining the children. I'm sorry I'm not there to help you, but this is, this is the way you should do that. And interspersed is always, and by the way, remember how much I love you. And then he says, uh, talks about co-signing notes. He talks about interpersonal relationships, and he says, and remember how much I love you. And uh, so you almost memorize this letter. You, you mark the places that talk about discipline and finances and everything like that, so that when a question comes up, you can go and talk to your husband via his letter. And at the end of the letter, oh, you read that every night before you go to bed, before you go to sleep. At the end of the letter, he says, I'll be home one of these days. Watch for me. Wait for me. Be faithful to me. I love you. And you cling to that love letter. Well, that's what God's Word is, isn't it? Mm. It's a love letter. It tells us all about the finances and the discipline and everything like that and interspersed is, uh, I love you. This thread that's woven all the way through. And at the end, he says, uh, I'll be coming back. Be faithful to me. Watch for me. Wait for me. I'll be home one of these days. Years ago, I saw a, a movie. I think the title of it was Love Letters. I don't know. and <laughs> None of you would remember it, I'm sure. But Joseph Cotton and Jennifer Jones were the um, stars. And it wasn't an unusual story for that time. It was a war story where these uh, soldiers came into the city and this one just uh, uh, won Jennifer's heart with all of his attention and his gifts and everything like that. And she fell in love with him. Well, it wasn't anything to him but kind of a weekend fling. And so he went back and she wrote to him and he talked to his roommate, Joseph Cotton. And he said, I don't want to write to her. He said, I'll pay you. How about you answering the letters? And so Joseph Cotton said he would. Listen, Jennifer fell in love with the man who wrote the love letters. And the song is still around. And here again, I wish I could burst into song. But it, uh, it, you still hear it occasionally. The theme song says, love letters straight from your heart. Keep us so near while apart. I'm not alone in the night when I can have all the love you write. I memorize every line. I kiss the name that you sign. And then, my darling, I read again right from the start, the love letter straight from your heart. Well, as you have read God's love letter, I'm sure your Bible looks just like mine. A man picked mine up one day, and Bill asked him to look up a scripture, and he said, "Why?" Well, I can't use this Bible. It's, it's too personal. I can't do that. And I'm sure that yours looks the same as mine. Um, there's, you don't need to open your Bibles. But the book of John is a favorite with a lot of us, isn't it? And uh, so when you get to John chapter 14 in my Bible, it's just, it's just hopelessly messed up with underlinings and highlights and everything like that. 
some of the verses, you know, like John 14, 1 and 2 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. We love those verses. But I wonder how many of you have underlined in John chapter 14, verse 20. I hadn't until one day someone showed me what John chapter 14, 20 means. John chapter 14, verse 20, in the New American Standard, reads this way. In that day you shall know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Ken Taylor, in his Living Bible paraphrase, says this, When I come back to life again, you're going to know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Okay, let, let me share with you what John 14, 20 means. We'll do a little expositional teaching here, just exposing the truth of John 14, 20. First of all, it says, when I come back to life again. That's after the fact, isn't it? Our whole faith is based on that. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's our Romans road, isn't it? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, if Christ has not been raised, then your, my preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So that's after the fact. When I come back to life again, Annabelle, you're going to know something. All right, Lord, what am I going to know? Now that know means to experientially understand unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt. Do you know what unequivocally means? I found out what it meant one day when, a, when one of our sons was undergoing some testing and, and the doctor called and he said, we can say almost unequivocally, Mrs. Gillum, that Will has the same disease that your son Mason had, and uh, he will be incurably ill and hopelessly retarded one of these days. And I thought, what does unequivocally mean? You know, and I went and looked it up. It means without a shadow of a doubt. Annabelle, you are going to know something unequivocally. Uh, for instance, when I was, oh, 11 or 12 years old, something was seared into my memory banks. I was in the kitchen cleaning up the breakfast dishes. And I guess because I didn't want to be in the kitchen cleaning up the breakfast dishes, when I unplugged the toaster, I jerked a little too hard on the cord. And one of the little gold prongs broke off in the opening there. Well, I didn't know what to do or what not to do, but I heard mother coming back to her domain. And I knew I'd better get it fixed before she got back there. And so I took a fork. <laughs> I know something. You don't put a fork there, and I don't do that anymore. I know something now. Some of you gals were out on a lonesome, deserted road one day, and you had a flat tire. And no Sir Galahad came along to change the tire, so you did it. You know, it took you two hours to do it, but you changed your tire. You, you know how to do that. I don't. But you know something. All right, Lord. When I come back to life again, Annabelle, you are going to know something unequivocally. All right, what am I going to know? Let me show you what you're going to know. I've asked my assistant here to help me. <laughs> when better, I, <laughs> as I gave that to you, better say that that doctor didn't know what he was talking about when he made that oh, diagnosis. Oh, no, he didn't. Praise God. Yeah. When I come back to life again, Annabelle, you are going to know something. You are going to know that I, Jesus, am in the Father, that you, Annabelle, are in me, and that I, Jesus, am in you. Now, can you see kind of how those are nestled there? You know you, how you need to claim John 14, 20? Listen. You need to let go. I heard a thump up here. And now when you look in there, I am nestled way down in there. I am in God, 
I'm in Jesus, and Jesus is in me. When I come back to life again, Annabelle, you're going to know that I am in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Now let me show you again what this means. Watch carefully. Nothing, nothing can come into my life unless it comes first through God, through Jesus, to get to me. And once it gets to me, finds me filled with Jesus. So what do I have to fear? What do I have to fear? Annabelle, when I come back to life again, you're going to know something, dear. You're going to know that you are enveloped in love. You're going to know that you are enveloped in my power, my security. You're going to know that I'm in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Now, if we know this truth, can we meet, as Bill says, Monday morning? Oh, we can. If we know this truth, can we fall more and more in love with the man who wrote the love letter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we know this truth, can we be faithful to him and watching for him when he comes back again? Oh, yes, we can. Wasn't that a great teaching? I love that. I've got a question for you. Has it been hard for you to really receive the love of Christ and to just to uh, rest in that? Well, if it has, then you can identify with Annabelle because she was that way. Till one day in her kitchen in Stillwater, Oklahoma, Jesus Christ came along and broke that barrier down. And he did it through one of our kids, Mason. Mace has been with the Lord since 1972, but his little life has just touched thousands of people. And our prayer is that uh, God will use his story to touch you as well. Let's listen to Annabelle. We've been talking about how we all need to be loved. And Bill has shared with us how we settle for conditional love instead of unconditional love. And uh, I needed to be loved. I guess if there's uh, one song that we could all sing without grabbing for our hymn books, it would be the song that we learned as children or that our children taught us from Sunday school. And that's the little song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. But I didn't know that. I knew the song, but I didn't know that Jesus loved me. Uh, I've shared with you how my whole life was built around performance-based acceptance. And in that, one of the things that I did, I kept everybody, as Bill has said, we all draw circles around ourselves. I kept everybody on the surface of my circle nobody ever got inside my circle because if they did they would see me when I wasn't performing when I didn't look perfect and then I believed that they wouldn't love me they wouldn't accept me so I never had any close friends at all now then I survived that way and then I got married somebody came into my circle and he didn't like me and so that just confirmed what I believed but I perform for others, I perform for Bill. Now when I become a Christian, I perform for God. I've been performing for everybody else, so now I'm going to perform for God. You mean, Annabelle, that you didn't know that God loved you? Oh yes, I knew that God loved me if my performance merited his love. And so I am performing for his love. Now then, that was my theology. I must perform for God. And as I began to read my Bible and to become familiar with my Bible, I came across verses that made me very uncomfortable. For instance, Hebrews 4.13, that says, I stand bare and wide open before the all-seeing eyes of a living God. What did that mean to me? <laughs> it meant that God saw me with curlers in my hair, you know, when I wasn't performing well. Psalm 139, that says he knows my every 
thought before I verbalized it on my soul and body. Somebody that knew me that well couldn't possibly love me. Now then, we have four sons. We have Press, Mace, Will, and Wade. Mason. Mason David Gillum, our second son, was profoundly retarded. Uh, Mace could sing one song with great gusto. Jesus loves me. I love to hear him sing it. He would sing it, and when he'd get to the chorus, he'd take that first yes and hold it out just as long as he could. He'd get out of breath, and he'd start giggling and almost fall out of his chair. Please listen. I never for a moment doubted that Jesus loved that profoundly retarded little boy. It didn't matter one iota that he would never sit wherever the kids sit in church and some Sunday night he'd get up and he'd come down and he'd take the pastor's hand and he'd say, Pastor, I want to invite Jesus into my life. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that he'd never go to summer camp, come home and say, Hey, Mom, Dad, uh, let me tell you what happened Friday night at the campfire. Didn't matter. It didn't matter that Mason couldn't quote one single memory verse, that he never went to Tuesday night visitation. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loved Mason David Gillum. What I did not know, what I could not comprehend, was that Jesus could love Mason's mother because of the way she performed. Well, God let me walk in that theology for many years. And then one day he decided it's time for Annabelle to get her theology straightened out. And he decided to straighten it out through a profoundly retarded little boy named Mason. Uh, we had to institutionalize Mace at a very early age. But we could bring him home for visits, and I could go over to Enid, Enid, Oklahoma, for visits over there. Now then, I have done this. I've gone over and picked him up at Enid. I've done it many, 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 many times. This weekend, I drive over and I pick him up, and something's going to happen that's going to change my life. I drive over and I get him on Thursday. I bring him home and he's been with us now Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning, and we have just finished dinner, lunch. And I'm washing up my dishes, and as soon as I finish washing my dishes, I'm going to take Mace back over to Enid. Mason is sitting in a chair. I could, I could touch him. He's sitting in a chair right there, watching me, looking at me. Now, as I am washing my dishes, something begins to happen to me. My stomach starts going around kind of like it is now. My heart starts thumping, and thoughts began coming into my thinking processes here, thoughts like this. As soon as I finish these dishes, I'm going to have to go around the house and pick up Mason's things and pack them and take him back to Enid. I don't think I can do that. I just don't think I can do that. And so I stopped washing my dishes. I picked up my tea towel and dried my hands off, off and I went over and I got down on my knees in front of Mace. And I looked at him, got direct contact with those beautiful brown eyes, and I said to him, I said, Oh, Mason, Mason, if only you could understand how much I love you. I love you, Mason. I love you. Oh, I wanted so desperately for my little boy to know that I loved him. But he didn't comprehend. He didn't respond. He didn't see me. He didn't hear me. So I stood back up 
to the sink and and uh, it was just a sense of urgency, a sense of panic almost that uh, that I just I couldn't explain. But just knowing that in a little while he would be gone again and everything I was have to go through and and I just couldn't endure it. So once again, I stopped washing my dishes. I dried my hands off. And I went over and I got down in front of Mace again. And I took those grubby little hands in mine. And I looked at him. And I said, oh, Mason, if only you could say to me, I love you, Mother. I need that. But there was nothing. I stood back up, and as I started washing those silly dishes, God spoke to me. And once again, it's not that I heard a voice. It's that thoughts, uh, thoughts that I had never thought, came into my conscious awareness. Oh, please listen. And let me share with you. I believe it was God talking to me, and this is what he said. He said, Annabelle, you don't look at your little boy and turn away from him repelled because he's sitting there with saliva drooling out of the corner of his mouth. Annabelle, you don't look at Mason and just turn away utter disgust because he's sitting there with his dinner all over his shirt or in a dirty, smelly diaper when he ought to be able to take care of himself. Annabelle, you don't look at Mason and reject him because all the dreams that you had for him are never going to come true. Annabelle, you don't look at Mason and reject him because he doesn't perform for you. You love him just because he's yours. And Annabelle, Mason doesn't willfully reject your love, but you willfully reject mine. I love you, Annabelle, not because you're attractive, not because you perform well. I love you, Annabelle, just because you're mine. Do you know that? Oh, do you know that? I don't know any of you intimately. I don't know you. Uh, you may not be able to go home tonight and nestle your head in your pillow and think, oh, God, I'm so glad that I have a husband who loves me. You may not have a husband, and you may not have one who loves you. You may not be able to, to nestle your head and think, oh, God, thank you for my children who love me. You may not have children who love you. They may be rebelling. But, oh, do you know that you can go home and you can nestle your head in your pillow and you say, Oh, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. I still can't uh, even hear Jesus loves me without a lump coming up in my throat uh, because I still visualize Mace. I still hear him sing bad and giggle. It's a very poignant memory. But you know, I can't hear the song or sing it because now I know something. I can't just, I can't just casually sing the words and how I wish I could burst into song now, but that would be ludicrous. But let me remind you, let me remind you of what they say. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. 
yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Me. Annabelle Hoyle Gillum. Jesus loves me. And my dear brothers and sisters, Jesus loves you.